Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, Paul Biederman, he runs Redesign and is also a very prolific pinner, as in Pinterester, as in person who used Pinterest. He's going to talk to Amber and I about why it works for him and why it will work for you. All that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the social hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is The Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur, episode 165, recorded Thursday, June 5th, 2014. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Offset.com, a new brand from Shutterstock. Offset provides a collection of high-end, royalty-free photography and illustration from award-winning talent. To receive a buy one, get one free image on new accounts, go to Offset.com slash welcome slash social hour. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another fun-filled episode of The Social Hour. It is episode 165, and from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur, and I'm here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and it's nice to see you, Sarah. It's nice to see you too, Amber. You know, we've, we've been talking offline between shows about schedules and this and that, and rumor has it that you might, might be able to visit us in the Twit studio possibly in a few weeks. Yeah, so uh, I'm flying out on the first and I believe I come back maybe late on the second or the third. So I'm just uh, going to look at my flight and see if I can make a quick trip out there. So I'm doing a speaking event out there, but other, other than that, I have no plans and it would be fun to get back up there. So Agreed. Uh, it would be would, our second time in real life in over a year. So I was just going to say that. I know. It's hard to believe that we will have only met two times potentially. I know. Hard to believe since we see each other every I week. I was so, so nervous the first time, and turns out we actually get along in real life. <laughs> so. There's a lot in common. I mean, I think that's the, the nice thing, right? If exactly. you look at our paths to how we got here, I think uh, in many ways there are definitely some similarities. Absolutely. So, Amber, the last couple of weeks I know that you've been saying, you know what we should do? We should get a, a Pinterest expert on the show, somebody who kind of lives and breathes breathes Pinterest because we talk about it here and there. I mean, it's obviously one of the larger social networks that has gained a lot of steam over the last couple of years, but I think but neither of us would, would be able to safely say that we ourselves are experts or necessarily know some of the kind of more nuanced ways that you can use it to your advantage. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, last week we had Stampy on who uh, does Minecraft videos on YouTube and he kind of ta taught us a little bit about building a community on YouTube and uh, super excited this week to have uh, Paul Biederman on who is going to talk about Pinterest and how you can use Pinterest to build up your personal brand or maybe you're starting a company and you want to get more attention on Pinterest. I first discovered him because I was writing an article about how to use Pinterest and somehow I stumbled across what work he had done and he was really helpful. And I also think it's kind of neat to have a guy talking about Pinterest, Sarah. I think so, too. I mean, Pinterest is certainly not a women's network, but uh, the demographic does skew female. And yes. I think a lot of a lot of people uh, or males or whoever say kind of like, oh, is this sort of like a women's thing? It's like scrapbooking. Anyway, instead of just talking about it amongst ourselves, we should invite <laughs> Paul onto the show. He's patiently waiting for us to finally get to him. Hey, Paul. Hey there, Sarah. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, as Amber nice mentioned, to be here. you're Amber. A, you're, nice to see you too. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's too. great to have you. And and um, I guess we should just kind of get into, you know, wh why why do you like Pinterest so much? Why does it work for you? And why might it work for other people? <laughs> well, yes, I am a guy who pins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there aren't many of us, I don't think yet, but uh, that might change because. Everything is getting so visual now. And, you know, that's true on all the platforms. And of course, you know, this one happens to be probably the most visual other than Instagram, I suppose. Uh, Facebook is getting more and more visual. Uh, even Twitter has become more and more visual. And Pinterest um, is, oh, there we go. There's my. Uh, there are all your. My presence. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you've got so a lot of stuff. You've got a lot of stuff on there. I do have a lot of stuff. It just sort of like accumulates over time. Um, Pinterest can really be a time suck, as I found out. So um, it's really a portfolio of whatever inspires you, whatever uh, you want to put out there that might further what you're trying to do as a company or your own presence online. Um, it's all about developing your professional reputation 
and that's true in all the social networks. Um, and, and on Pinterest, it gives you an opportunity to show um, rather than tell. Uh, so this is sort of like a visual representation of all that I'm about, um, all that I find inspiring, all the work that I think uh, is uh, top of the line and what people should strive to do for themselves. Um, and since the social networks are getting so, so visual, there's so much noise out there now. And to be honest, there's also a lot of very amateurish um, images and you know, there's a lot of things there that are fighting for your attention. And I think the more that people understand what really good work is, the more they're going to be able to uh, up their own pre uh, their own image themselves. So it's really about, you know, for me, finding inspiration wherever I look. And I tend to uh, do it in the later hours in the day because, as I said, it can be a time suck. And uh, like most of you out there, uh, I'm sure that you're uh, preoccupied with uh, your projects or your clients or what have you during the day. And uh, Pinterest can, you know, once you go down the tunnel or the rabbit hole, uh, sometimes it's hard to escape. So I find it to be a nice, relaxing thing to, to do when I'm out of my office and I'm in my chair, maybe the TV's on or something like that, or I'm with family even, um, you know, just uh, searching for some really inspiring stuff. And there's so much out there. So I mean, you uh, go ahead, Amber. Oh, so I, I was just curious, and, and maybe Sarah was going to ask a similar question, but how has it helped you in your business? You touched on it a little bit, but what value do you think it is bringing to your business and what you do? Are there concrete examples that you have, or is it more just a, a gut feeling? The concrete example that I have, actually, is that it is uh, now one of the top drivers of web traffic to my website, um, which is interesting because pins kind of like never die. You know, when you tweet something, it's here this second and go on pretty much the next second, you know, uh, Facebook posts last a little bit longer, but not that, that much longer. Um, the other platforms, they just sort of operate in a different way, but pins always tend to resurface. Uh, once they're out there, uh, people will find them and re repin them. And, uh, if you're posting original graphics, uh, or if you're posting, um, a blog post of yours, um, it will link directly back to your website. And those over time start to accumulate. And pretty soon you might have hundreds of pins on the same pin, repins on the same pin. And that's all driving traffic to your website. So um, I've also seen an uptick in phone calls, basically, you know, because of what I'm pinning. So, you know, it's interesting. I wonder if there's something to the visual nature of Pinterest that makes it a better, you, know, you say it's a, it's a big driver back to your website that people are somehow paying more attention. Uh, and I, I don't know, I don't know, maybe because Twitter is sometimes visual, and as you said, trying to become more of a multimedia type of a network, but there's just so much noise and things are scrolling by fast and there's a single feed that I find that people don't really click through a lot of my links if I'm looking at uh, statistics. You know, often I get very few, you know, even though I think it's something really special. Maybe there's something to Pinterest because it's it's all about not just organizing things, but stuff that, as you said, is inspirational but visually. So it's almost like a better click-through rate for, you know, somebody who's promoting themselves or their business or what have you. Right. And I think that's really kind of a function of something that's visual and draws you in uh, itself. So I think that's true on all of social, you know, uh, the more graphic you are, uh, studies have proven over and over again that uh, that will capture interest and that will draw people in. Um, and Pinterest does it, you know, probably as good as anybody. So uh, the better your pins, the better the visuals that you're putting out there. Um, and if you're creating your own original pins, um, I really, you know, stress the importance of creating really interesting visuals uh, that are clear and sharp um, and the right size. Vertical images tend to work very well on Pinterest. They will stand out more in the stream. Um, if you just look at a general page, uh, the smaller images uh, just don't grab attention the same way as the larger ones do. It's always the vertical ones that stand right. out. So it's very important, I think, on your own website to... Uh, you know, create 
the type of images that will draw people in. And uh, if people are, you know, savvy enough, they will pin them and again, keep, you know, spreading all that good stuff about who you are and what you're about. And that's always driving traffic back to uh, what it is you're, you know, trying to draw at- attention to. So, yeah. Just a, a quick tweet from Jim, who uh, just tweeted out, says, great points from Paul. It's hard to get great info now that everyone posts everything about anything, when I think that just really hits on the point and what you just mentioned. I'm curious in terms of your daily process with Pinterest, because I've tried a, a couple of different apps. Are there certain tools that you use when you're posting to Pinterest? Could you kind of share your process with us? Uh, all I use are some extensions, basically, because the pin, uh, it's important that the button, I guess, is easy to access and not... Everybody has the pin um, uh, function uh, activated on their websites or on their pages. So it's very, I use Chrome. So I have an extension where I can just click the pin button and then all the images uh, that are to be selected or chosen from uh, show up and then I I can select the pin right there. Um, but I think it's important on your own website to make sure that it's very easy for other people to pin because they might not have that extension. So there are different ways of doing that. Um, but uh, the more opportunities, I think, that you give people to share uh, your good stuff, um, the better off it's going to work for you. You know, Paul, you mentioned that it's something that you, know, you kind of find soothing a little bit, kind of hanging out on Pinterest, collecting some stuff and, and getting inspiration. I uh, was actually really active on Pinterest while I was uh, buying some new furniture for my apartment. This was last year, and you know I put a bunch of stuff in one place, and I kept going back to it, and 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 people made little comments, and that was really helpful. Um, in fact, uh, one of my coworkers, Liz, is moving uh, to a new apartment, and she says she's doing the same thing. What about so so? It's I, I think that Pinterest makes a lot of sense when you've kind of got uh, some sort of visual goal that you're working toward. What about? People who say, well, I'm not really doing any redecorating, you know, and you know, I'm not really looking to, like, make a new garden. I'm not really a particularly <clears throat> visual person. You know, I'm not like that kind of design, aesthetic, creative type of a thing. Is, is there a place on Pinterest for somebody who's like, I want to be involved, but a lot of the stuff is a little too stylized for me. I don't know how I fit in. Hmm, interesting. I think that you can basically search for anything that you might be interested in. Uh, search works very well on on the platform. Um, I mean, everyone's interested in something, right? And if you are, you can find it on that platform. So if you want to travel or if you, uh, you know, I live uh, near the water, so I like to pin photographs, you know, locally uh, around town and things that I think people would be interested in knowing if they, uh, you know, were to visit here or uh, are interested in learning more about me and where I'm from or what have you. Uh, I'm going to be traveling to uh, Europe next month. So uh, I'm starting to pin more and more images about that as well. And, uh, you know, it's just very uh, inspiring to see all the great images that are out there. But I would say, you know, start with search. Uh, if you have a hobby or uh, if you love good food, you know, there's recipes, there's all kinds of things to be found. So uh, just to, one last question from me, and it's around Pinterest and, and the valuation of Pinterest, which was recently, I think the company was valued at uh, over $3 billion. I'm curious from your standpoint, I know Pinterest is trying to start to bring in some revenue, but do you think Pinterest is a long-term play? Do you believe that, you know, we're still going to be using this platform five, 10 years down the road? Uh, that's interesting. I think we are, but I think it's going to probably evolve as all the platforms do. Um, I'm not sure exactly where Pinterest is going to go, but, uh, but, uh, I do know that the, the visuals here to stay, the visual has always been such an important part of media. And, uh, I think it's been, you know, uh, lacking for quite a long time online. And now I think online is catching up where we've always been with TV and uh, print and, you know, all those other media avenues that maybe we aren't quite spending, you know, as much time with are still important, I think. And I think we are spending time there, but not as much as we are online. And, and now I think everything is starting to get up to speed. And as the bandwidth keeps increasing, you know, and people get more into video and uh, I, you know, I think it's here to stay for sure because the visual is. 
One last question for me, Paul, before we let you go. You mentioned uh, right at the beginning of the interview, yes, you're a guy who pins. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a kind of a title. <laughs> Why is it that it is something that's a bit of an anomaly? Why, why aren't more men, there are plenty of men who are interested in design or projects or whatever. Why is it such a women's network? And why does that, that, that seem to be this thing that, that, that doesn't seem to go away? I'm sure Pinterest would, would like it to be a little bit more 50-50 because that means potentially just more people. Well, guys like cars, guys like all kinds of things that uh, they can find there. Um, personally, I do have a theory on this, and it's very simple. Um, it's branding, actually, oriented, which is one of my specialties. And um, I think the word pin itself doesn't quite sound right to a guy. I mean, I never really pinned things before in real life. I think, you know, maybe pinning things is more of a female oriented activity or uh, just sounds more like that. I collect things. I, you know, I might nail something onto a wall, but I'm not going to pin something. And it just sort of, to me, doesn't sound quite right for the male audience. I, I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I'm nuts, but uh, what do you think? <laughs> we throw it back to you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, you know, we've, we've got um, our chat room for, for our live viewers right now. Um, Gray 580 says maybe it has to do with the layout of the page that women are drawn to. You mentioned vertical images work really well. I have no idea. I don't know if that's a thing. I don't know if there's some visual element that is working for the female gender. I, Amber, I mean, do you have any? I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm honestly curious because I don't know why. It's not like the website's all pink and kitties mm -hmm. and, you know, the stuff like that. Maybe I'm just talking about things that I like, not necessarily all women. But it's not as if it's made for women in any way. It does feel like a, a, when you're pinning something, it feels like a dainty term, if I can use that word, mm. because it, it That's feels... That's exactly it does, what I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, it feels so a little feel bit more way. feminine, right? And uh, like Instagram is like, wow, I'm going to go Instagram that, like take a hammer and Instagram, <laughs> but you're not like, oh, I'm right. going to pin that, right? You know, it does, it's just a dainty word. And I'm, I'm exactly. imagining from... A, you know, Paul, you're a branding person, you know, that does have an impact, right? What we name people, what we name different things, and it can really steer people, uh, you know, especially when it comes to gender towards uh, a certain platform. I think it does, as simple as it sounds to me. I think that has a lot to, you know, I, I think the name, you know, pinning and... Uh, I think if you called it like nailing things to a wall or something, you get more men, you know. Um, I, uh, and also it's a self sort of like uh, perpetuating situation because the more women who are there, the more, you know, maybe female oriented type of things you're going to see pinned. Uh, you know, women like to pin makeup. Women like to yeah. pin, you know, sty styles and dresses and uh, summer wear and things like that. So, uh, you know, the more of that stuff that's on there, too, the more, you know, it just sort of it's circular. So I think the more men that go to Pinterest, the more that's going to change and evolve. And over time, it'll get there. But uh, but that word pin, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, where, where can people find you on Pinterest? Pinterest, uh, under my name. It's a little hard to spell, so I'll spell it Paul. Last name is B-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N-N. -N. Right. It's Biederman, and I'm at redesign2.com. Paul, right. thanks so much for joining us and just kind of not only giving us a little bit more of how you use Pinterest, but helping us get a little bit, bit, bit of perspective from the male side of Pinterest how, yes. as we all try to figure out if, if pinning is a dainty word or what else we should call it. It's, <laughs> it's kind of great. There's, there's a whole uh, other... Uh, a bunch of people in our chat room saying we could, yeah, like nailing, um, right. hardwareist Pinterest right. could, could, yeah, kind of have like the, the guy's Pinterest. Anyway, we could go <laughs> on and on. Shoving into a folder, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a strong way. I don't, yeah, something, you know, a little tougher, <laughs> a little bit more manly. But thanks for the uh, equal opportunity here. <laughs> Absolutely. It was really fun. And thanks for coming on and, uh, and joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Great Paul. to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Amber, do you think do you think we've gotten a little bit better of a sense of of how people use Pinterest? I mean, Paul again is he's a design guy, so this is the sort of thing that feeds into his interests and what he's thinking about. And I really liked the idea that he's like, you know, at the end of a long day, this is something that I enjoy doing, and I I I think that that's for a lot of people um, exactly why Pinterest is somehow like meditative or something. You know, I use Pinterest on. 
almost never on my computer, but on my iPad, I love just sort of like browsing and sometimes I'm pinning stuff and I don't really care where I get lost. You know, I'm sort of like, I get lost on people's boards and it almost doesn't matter because I don't really have a goal. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone. Yeah, no, I think I think you're exactly right. I think it's one of those things with um, uh, Pinterest, and I think Paul really uh, touched on this, just uh, the idea that uh, um, I think people are just really attracted to it because you are able to share so many images and you are able to post stuff there that uh, doesn't take a long time to post. I mean, I think that's attractive as well. But uh, I, I, you know, it's it, when he said that, when he talked about using it in terms of something that he enjoyed almost like a hobby, it made me feel really lazy because I think about how I use Twitter and I use Twitter like that. At the end of the day, I'll sit there with my phone and I'll flip through all of the, the Twitter messages, but I'm not actively really doing anything. So I feel like it's it's a more productive version of what I do anyway to relax using a social network. So maybe I just have to be, be more proactive. I need another I need another project. I need a reason to go back to using Pinterest more often. It's funny, it's, you know, Paul was, and of course he's not stereotyping anybody, he's just saying, yeah, you know, there's a lot of makeup, you know, or fashion or dresses and, you know, stuff that, that women pin. It's like, <laughs> when I pin stuff, it's like, I'm pinning like audio video consoles. <laughs> <laughs> like, those are the sorts of things where I'm like, ooh, beautiful, <laughs> more yeah. of those. So it's really, I mean, it's just, it's an individual thing. It's this kind of thing it you're is. into. Yeah, and Rob on Twitter just mentions, he says, most of the women I know on Pinterest liken it to scrapbooking. And I think that's a, a perfect example of, of how people view Pinterest. It, it has really been like virtual scrapbooks and traditionally more women have been into scrapbooking. So I think the demographics are kind of changing a little bit with Pinterest. And I think we'll see more men who are using it like Paul, but it's a, an interesting conversation nonetheless. Absolutely. All right, well, we've got some news to get to, some social tips, some spotlights, rad or fad, of course. We never do a show without that. But first, let's take a moment to thank Offset for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. Offset.com is a new brand from our friends at Shutterstock, who of course you know because they sponsor a lot of shows on Twitter and we love them very much. Offset is a curated collection of the highest end photos, the highest quality images and illustrations from the people around the world who are the top editorial and commercial artists. I mean, these are cream de la creme. Uh, contributors are uh, featured in magazines like National Geographic. I mean, it's like basically the best photographers ever, or Condé Nast Traveler, or even Martha Stewart, uh, stuff like that. So it's it's travel photos, it's lifestyle photos. It's These are the kind of photos that they're not just some sort of a, a stock image. They're telling some sort of a story. And maybe whatever project you're working on really needs something like that. And maybe you don't have the skills, you don't have the right cameras, you're not gonna be in, in another country that you are going to talk about anytime soon. That's where this kind of stuff really comes in handy. A lot of the subjects in these photos are, are captured from real life moments. This is not staged, it's not you know in a studio somewhere, they're not posed shots. What's nice about Offset also is that they provide simplified pricing and licensing with global usage rights. So each image has two price points, $250 for shots suitable for the web, $500 for high resolution, which is suitable for print. Uh, depending on your project, you might need both or just one and one might make sense to you. Every image in the collection is also royalty free. So there's simple terms. You get rights to manage quality, which is really important. Uh, Bob Croslin is a Tampa-based commercial and editorial photographer. He works in Florida and throughout the Southeast. If you haven't heard of Mr. Croslin, he's worked at the Tampa Tribune and msnbc.com. He uh, started a freelance career in 2006. I mean, his stuff is incredible. Look at those owls. You, the audio listeners, you got you to gotta check this guy out on Offset because <laughs> his photos are they're really unique. I mean, they're just absolutely beautiful. His work, um, you know, is in ESPN, Time Magazine, Men's Fitness, Fast Company. The list goes on. Uh, and he's, you know, he's, he's just one of the best. These are the sorts of shots that, I'm sorry, I could probably spend my entire life trying to be as good as Bob, and it's just not going to happen. So if you want to explore Offset today to see photos like this and just a huge variety, do go to offset.com slash welcome slash social hour, offset.com slash welcome slash social hour. You can sign up for a free account and find an image that tells your story. And for a buy one, get one free image on new accounts, just use our URL, offset.com slash welcome slash social hour. 
You're going to love it. Thanks to Offset for their support of our show. All right, Amber, so uh, earlier in the week, I, I really wanted to talk about this because, I don't know, I just like Justin Timberlake and I like any so excuse do I. to... Yeah. yeah, I mean, who doesn't like Timberlake? I don't think there is a person out there who doesn't like Timberlake. It's sort of like John Hamm. He's just, like, universally liked by everybody. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a neat story. He, um, uh, some time ago, had asked fans tweet to him, you know, at... Uh, Justin Timberlake, I think is his Twitter handle, uh, love stories, you know, little stuff, you know, sh short little snippets. And he, nobody knew at the time, but of course he's got a lot of fans, so he got a lot of responses. But he was building uh, 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 data for a video. And the tweets, if you're lucky enough to be part of it, uh, some of them are featured in his video. He wanted them to use the hashtag uh, not a bad love story and uh, a lot of people did and then uh, this stuff got uh, woven into a, uh, a video of his. Now if I would have known that ahead of time Amber I might have contributed but it's almost cooler <laughs> that people sort of did it just because they thought hey Justin asked me for something and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, respond. I think it's almost a little bit more I don't know organic uh, if you don't know that maybe you're going to get featured, you know, have that like two seconds of fame type of thing in a video. What do you think? I think it's great. I love that he did this. I mean, I think it just, again, shows uh, the power that he has where people actually just want to send him their photos or their vines and share all that content with him. But it was such an interesting way to use content from his fans and just being able to create a music video and, and have those authentic moments, right? I mean, that's the stuff that I think people love so much. And yet so many of the music videos that we see today are overly produced. I mean, they're just absolutely uh, inauthentic in many ways. So it's a, a really nice idea. And uh, I'm glad that he did it you know he's he's always kind of been so creative and always thinking of uh, interesting things to do especially in the social media space so it's fun to uh, watch what he did here it's a he's a really he, he's very good yeah. well I was about to say he's really really good at social and we actually have a myspace story so I don't know if that's totally true all the time <laughs> but I do feel like he is he's very much a What's the word I'm looking for? He's one of those, I guess, celebrities, you know, musician, actor, whatever, that does seem like he really gets a kick out of this stuff. Hmm. You know, he likes that interactivity. He's doing it. He does a lot of web video. Um, he's, he's involved in a lot of, the, you know, kind of like funny or die stuff. I, I, I think, I don't know, he seems to really kind of understand the digital medium and, and participation aspect of it. Maybe yeah, I just yeah. like him so much I'm... I, you he's know, perfect, just Sarah. hoping he's that just he perfect. is that kind of person. But yeah, he's yeah, he's, he's you good, don't need to say anything guy. else. He's perfect. Uh, <laughs> before we get on to the MySpace story, I just want to mention really quickly, and I didn't have time to put it in the show notes, but a friend of mine just messaged me an article that was from, I think, Business Insider that was talking about how there's an increase in the number of people who are actually signing social media prenups before they get married. And in those prenups, it says things like, oh, you know, you'll, you'll never take a bad picture of me or, or share things or, you know, hack into my Facebook account. And it's absolutely ridiculous, but Wait. it kind of feeds into our story last week. What? Really? Yeah. I mean, a, so, so a prenup, you know, prenuptial agreement is something that, you know, both parties oh. sign. It's usually money based. But like, oh, so it would be something like if something goes sour between the two of us, you're not going to drag me through the mud on yeah. your Facebook feed. Well, you know, I mean, it sounds a little crazy, but I guess I can see why if someone's like, my reputation is very important, I've got a business to run, this is the sort of thing that, you know, yeah, like that, like it's blackmail kind of, kind of right? stuff. I promise never to blackmail you via social media. It's that's sort of fascinating that people feel the need to do that, but I guess in some cases, you're sorry if you don't. Yes, and uh, no one likes old photos of themselves, and this is our segue into the MySpace story because uh, that's what this story is all about. MySpace is embarrassing users with old photos to try to win them back. Uh, I first heard people tweeting about this a few days ago. I thought, oh, it's kind of interesting. I guess that's MySpace's strategy to try to get people to return to the site. Will it work? I'm not quite sure. What do you think, Sarah? I think it will not work. Uh, the, the thing is, is that MySpace reinvented itself, you know, I mentioned Justin Timberlake, he's, a, he's an investor, a large investor, but uh, not the only one, but, he, but he's a majority investor. MySpace really tried to like reinvent itself and come back, what was this, a year ago, two years ago, whenever that yeah. was, and we all kind of talked about it because it's like, wow, MySpace is really different. They're, it's, it's a very different network. Everybody pretty much jumped over to Facebook. Facebook is kind of, it's still got its claws in the world as far as social networking goes. 
And yeah, I haven't been back to MySpace. I just don't have, I, I, I just don't have a need. So the idea that I would now be spammed in my email inbox, which is the most annoying thing anyway. I mean, I hate networks that do that. I unsubscribe for, from all of that stuff. Uh, is only going to irritate me more, especially if it's some old photograph that I, you know, kind of forgot existed or, you know, for whatever reason might remind me of a time that I don't want to remember. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I dislike most about some of these, like, memory apps. Time Hop is one of them where they'll say, like, a year ago today, here's what you were doing because you shared this photo on whatever, it's, you know, Foursquare. And I'm like, ugh, I hate that guy, you know? I... I don't want to remember today a year ago or something like yeah. that. So I think in general, unsol unsolicited, hey, remember when you used MySpace, makes the network seem even more kind of desperate and old. It does. I just was bringing up your MySpace account. I was curious. Uh, <laughs> what was not, there? There's not much there, Amber. Not much yeah, there. Yeah, there's not much there. Mm -hmm. I don't know about my own, but uh, I think you're right. You know, it's, it, sometimes it's nice just to leave the past behind with these different social networks. You don't need to be re reminded of all these things. I even hate Throwback Thursday, to be honest with you, as a trend on social media. Do you I really? Know, I, I don't know. I just... I don't know what it is. I just feel like, stop looking in the past. Like, let's look to the future. I have this instinctive reaction when people post all these old photos. Like, okay, I get it. Like, you were a child once, right? Um, <laughs> I know, it's the weirdest thing. But uh, maybe that's because my parents had no baby photos of me. So I'm not sure uh, what went on during the first five years of my life. I might just be envious of others. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's one of those things that, yeah, I don't really need those images uh, uh, brought out. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, the MySpace days, I'm, I'm good without them. I am too. I, I just, you know, I, I don't have any need hmm. for MySpace. And maybe that's being unfair. You know, maybe I'm missing the point. But no, I, I don't think the old photo thing is, you know, past did that to me the other day. I got this, you know, again, I'm obviously a path user, even though I don't, I don't actually use the app anymore at all. I, I pretty much abandoned it completely. But I got an email from Path the other day saying, here's what you've missed on Path. And they were um, little sort of, uh, I don't know, like almost like a card sort of interface, little snippets from people that you know, I am connected with on Path, stuff that I hadn't seen because I hadn't opened the app in a while. And I was like, who asked you? I, I mean, isn't that the point of the app is... I will go in there and catch up if I need to, and I guess I haven't felt the need to. It just, I hate that stuff. Yeah, I'm with you on that. It's, you know, it's, yeah, Ch Ch chances are you don't need to be reminded to go back into those old old platforms. But if anyone loves MySpace still, I think you should definitely let us know because maybe we're just missing something entirely because uh, I know they've made some changes. It does look like a better service, but for me, it just, uh, it's not part of my daily ritual anymore. Not at all. Not at all. All right, let's move on to something that is daily ritual. Um, in fact, uh, we, we've interviewed people who are quite good at it, and that's Vine. Vine is, you know, like it or hate it, Vine is, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hot as far as, you know, looping vi six-second videos go. <laughs> it is hot, you know, and I think uh, we showed when we had our uh, Vine star on the show a couple weeks ago, we even showed some Vine videos, one, one from Lowe's where they did quick little uh, 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 tips for home renovations. And I think when people are getting so creative with Vine, this is just an interesting story because we have talked about the rise of social television and, and how more and more we're getting um, all of our screens in our homes are getting connected with social media tools. So this story talks about how Vine is making the jump to TV with uh, an upcoming Xbox One app. So. Uh, uh, looks like uh, there were there was an announcement recently of 45 new apps for Microsoft's Xbox One and Xbox 360 gaming console. And uh, one of those apps is, in fact, Vine. So if you want to sit on your couch and you have one of these consoles, you can then uh, really just kind of flip through Vine videos. You could watch a lot of Vine videos in five minutes, right, Sarah? I'm not going to do the math right now, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean, apps. is the big TV the right medium for Vine and... Maybe I'm not thinking outside the box enough. It's also sort of curious. Vine, of course, is owned by Twitter. And it's a little bit curious to me that it's an Xbox app uh, you know, before anything else. It's, I don't know, maybe the partnership seems a little odd to me. But do I want you... One of the reasons that Vine is a little irksome to me is the looping nature of the videos. You know, unless you're scrolling, you know, you, you, if you stay on one, it's just going to loop over and over. And... Maybe I like it on the smaller screen a little bit more. I mean, I'm never going to Vine on my iPad even. That sort of seems like, ooh, it's a little too much in my face. 
Maybe mm. I'm just following obnoxious Vine artists. I don't know. But it's like, am I going to feel compelled to open that up on the biggest screen I have, which is my TV in my living room, and kind of consume Vines that way? I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what my answer is because I haven't tried it, but it seems like it could be a little, a little too much, a little overwhelming. Yeah, I don't know. It, it does. I agree with you. I mean, you think about having a, a big screen in your home and sitting down. Really, you want great graphics. You want a great visual experience. And I don't think that's something necessarily that Vine can offer in the quick little six-second videos. But I do think, obviously, because Twitter is behind Vine, this is just part of their overall, overall strategy to work with television producers and networks and consoles or whatever it might be, because we know more and more that Twitter is destined to get into the living room, into the entertainment world in terms of the content you're consuming. And this is is just an extension of that. So it just feels like it's just like one of their continuing steps to be able to kind of own the social experience when it comes to television, no matter what type of format that may be. Yeah, vying on the big screen via, via the Xbox. I actually don't have an yeah. Xbox, so it's not something that I can use yet. I guess unless I, no, well, I guess, I guess I could, well, anyway, I, I, can, I can work through that. Um, how how I would get Vine onto my big screen? Because if I mirror my iPad or something, I could. You could do. I, I'm a, I do have an Xbox, so maybe I'll try it and see. Give it a go, it yeah, and see. Like. Maybe you maybe you'll love Vine more than ever. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I'm a little. Dead. You don't sound convinced. <laughs> don't sound I'm convinced. convinced. I know. I just Vine. Yeah, what are you gonna do? Hey, so let's talk. We mentioned Facebook. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Facebook. India has reached a bit of a milestone. Yeah, I thought this was worth mentioning because uh, so often with the show, we tend to get a little uh, uh, U.S. centric in many ways and uh, or even Canadian centric if uh, that ever happens. But an interesting stat, Facebook has just reached 100 million users this past April in India. So a massive market, obviously, for the Facebook network. And uh, it seems based on this article that's on the Economic Times that uh eventually in India will probably surpass the U.S. and it won't take that long in terms of the number of people who are Facebook users. So um, as much as we may talk about Facebook in this part of the world as dying off a little bit and losing a certain demographic and uh, particularly teens, there is growth in other markets. So I thought it was worth noting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 100 million users is, uh, I mean, for most networks, that's a ton. Obviously, for Facebook, it's like Facebook has right. billions of users. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, that's still a huge subset, though. Um, and obviously, there are so many people in India and, uh, you know, in a developing country, so many more people are getting online, um, in, in many cases, mobile, um, just kind of bypassing the whole Facebook on a desktop experience altogether. So, yeah, it just goes to show that Facebook's really uh, thinking ahead and doing the right thing, putting so much emphasis on its mobile apps, even though sometimes we on the social hour are, get a little confused, like, what is Facebook doing? And now they got another standalone app and this and that. But, yeah. but again, as, as, as people continue to um, get online, um, and particularly on, on mobile apps, you know, via iOS and Android and Windows and all that stuff, um, it makes sense when you see numbers like this. It definitely does. Now, for our social tip of the week, uh, this social tip is driven by an experience that I just had yesterday and, and kind of the day before. I was hosting a, a Google Hangout on air, and I've done them before, Sarah, a few times. And this time, you know, not that a lot was that different, but it just made me think as I was explaining Google Hangouts on air and going through the process of signing someone up to do one of these and getting them involved in it, how absolutely complicated Google has made Hangouts, uh, or particularly Hangouts on air in terms of the complexity of setting them up and, and how you actually have to, to create the Hangout on Air. Have you ever done one, Sarah, out of curiosity? We have experimented with Hangouts um, on Twit. Um, there have been, you know, a couple like live specials where we'll have a Hangout and, and like invite people to sort of jump on with us. It's never been a very seamless process, though. And in fact, we, we've sort of st started to stay away from it because it, um, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work that well. Now, of course, this is a studio setting, so things are a little bit different here, and we we connect in, in sort of weird ways. But, but no, I've never really felt the need to do a hangout on air, Amber. And I, I you know, I, I'm sure it's it's something that I could figure out eventually. But I think it's confusing, and I feel it like is. you know, if, if I do, a lot of other people do. 
Yeah. And I, I, like I said, I've set them up before so I can do it. You know, it's just that I think that they've made it too complicated for the average person who maybe isn't that tech savvy. And as a result, I think they're turning a lot of people off of Hangouts on air. And it, it's such an amazing platform. I mean, the fact that they have automatic switching, and you can have up to 10 people on webcam, a live chat, you can stream YouTube videos. I mean, so much is so compelling. But to go set it up and to schedule it and then to try to edit it and add people and get them involved in the system, there are a lot of little weird little things that can happen on the way. So for our social tip of the week, I just wanted to, and we'll put this in the show notes, link to this article from uh, Jeff Bullias, who basically has 10 tips on how to use Google Plus Hangouts. Oh, nice. And he talks step-by-step step about how to set it up, how to promote it. And I think in many ways, his step-by-step tutorial here on his website is better than what Google even offers on their website. So it's a great resource if you want to try it at Google Hangout. I, I do encourage people to use the platform. It is awesome in so many different ways. But when you set it up and you're trying to embed it on another site and get other people on, you will run into some roadblocks. But if you read this, I think you'll have a better understanding of how to avoid some of them. Yeah, I, I like the natural language aspect of this. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, Ryback in our chat room says, Google is often too complicated by engineers for engineers. It is. I agree. And, I you know, I think, I think Ryback, you're on to something there. there. You know, there was a few Google stories that I was covering a couple days ago and for Tech News Tonight. And, you know, I'm going to the official Google blogs that are kind of explaining what they're doing. You know, and they're all blog spot blogs, right? Because, of course, Google bought Blogger however many years ago. And a lot of the stuff I'm looking at and it's like, yeah, okay, I can re I can read the post. I, I understand what's being said. It's not as if I don't understand what Google's going for, but often there's a very sort of cold mechanic quality to the way that Google kind of officially speaks to the user base mm -hmm. that is odd. And maybe it's because there is such an engineer culture there, but it's not it's not often very user friendly, even though they're making tools that are designed to specifically be user friendly. Sometimes it does seem a little like programmery, and I just made that word up, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, but yeah, I think there there is something to that. Yeah, it does. It, it's a little bit complex, uh, and it doesn't. I don't think it has to be, but just someone needs to go through and make it much more user friendly. And I think they'd have much more success, not not just with uh, Google Plus Hangouts on air, but with the platform in general and Google Plus Hangouts. So, um, a great article by Jeff that we'll, we'll link to in our show notes. Now, this is another really cool thing, Sarah, for our social media. Maybe we could call it the social media marketing spotlight of the week. This is a, another story about WestJet, which is a Canadian airline that we talked about a couple of months ago, or a few months ago. They did a really great Christmas campaign where they went and they bought gifts that people wanted for an oh, entire yeah. flight. People had a lot of success with that. Um, I have no affiliation with the airline, but I just thought it was interesting. They have another hit on their hands, and this one just in time for Father's Day. Uh, we can uh, play some of the video, but I'm probably going to just talk through it because it's quite a long video. And the gist of it is that uh, they came up with a Father's Day surprise for a, a dad whose uh, child was quite sick and, and, and required long-term care in one of the Ronald McDonald houses. And uh, the, the, the child was 300 miles away from the parents. Now, the mom was with the child, but the dad had to work. So he was, you know, stuck working and didn't get to visit that often. Well, WestJet went in. They took one of their employees and trained their employees to do the father's job. He worked for the oh transportation department in the city. So the guy trained to do the father's job. The, the WestJet employee shows up at the dad's workplace, and I'm getting ahead of myself in the video a bit, but shows up at the dad's workplace, and they're interviewing the mom here, and basically says, you know what, here's your ticket to go visit your, your son, and I'm gonna do your job for a bit. You can go enjoy yourself. It's all paid for by WestJet. And it's just a great, great story and uh, just a, a, another win for them, I think. Yeah, go WestJet. Now, I, I, what I want to know is how did WestJet find out about this family? I mean, is it something that they were written? It's like, how do they, how do they seek these people out and, and basically surprise him? Well, I think because they do work with the Ronald McDonald House uh -huh. charity, based on this article in Mashable, they then uh, found a family that really needed some help and an opportunity for the dad to get to visit the child. And what I think is so interesting here, Sarah, is that this video is five minutes long. And if you remember the Christmas video that WestJet did, it was also very long. I mean, it's a long story. And we think of these little micro videos that are six seconds making an impact in the social media world. But if you have a great, compelling story, and something you want to share and, it, and it's told well, I mean, people will sit and watch 
you know, four or five minutes because not very often I watch videos this long, especially from a brand. Yeah, I think this is great. I mean, there's just, you know, sure, WestJet gets its name out there, but, uh, you know, it's there, this is such a do-good type of a thing. I just love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's a great. So we'll also link to this in our show notes and you can check it out. And it's nice to see a company, you know, do more than just try to get people to like them on Facebook, but actually go back and give back to the community. So a heartwarming story. It really is. And, and, and good for them. Hey, if this is the way that you're going to get people to talk about you, good for you. You know, yeah, you could be one of those companies where one of your social media interns you know, like post some slur on Twitter and then you have to apologize and, and then people talk about you too. This is like, the, it's like the perfect goodwill. Let's get the word out. We've got some great people working in the executive office at this airline, you know? I, I don't know if I've ever taken WestJet, Ember. I don't know if WestJet, does, does WestJet fly outside of Canada or just within Canada itself? Uh, they fly from Canada to the U.S. So if you were coming to Canada, you would have the option to take WestJet, mm. but uh, they there don't fly domestically within the United States. Well, I might be in Canada um, next month. We can talk what? about that. We can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, if so, I hope I take WestJet. And if I do, I'm going to tell all the people working there that I like their videos. <laughs> Love it. Uh, a very, very different kind of a spotlight uh, before we move on to our router fad. I just wanted to quickly mention um, Tinder has gotten an update. Now, I know that yeah, everyone goes like, haha, Tinder, it's a hookup app. Well, it can be, I suppose. Tinder is a dating app, and it's a very much like that hot or not type of a thing where you see someone's photo and you swipe left for yes and s swipe left for no, swipe right for yes. <laughs> yes, meaning I think that I might want to talk to this person. If they also swipe right, meaning they like you, on the other side, the two of you are matched, and then you kind of go into this little place where you can message each other. You have no way to message them otherwise. You have to both kind of give the thumbs up. That's sort of the beauty of Tinder is that it's just really easy to kind of like take that first step. Now, mm -hmm. I, as a you know, not just somebody who likes to research these sorts of things, but a single person. Um, there are a lot of people that, you know, you match with, but it's like, I'm not just going to, like, talk to everybody. It's like, it's very easy to swipe right on somebody and match with them. And then what do you do? And also, mm -hmm. it's like, is it just about going on dates? Because it's, you know, who's got the time for all of that stuff? Well, Tinder wants to be a little bit more of a um, social app, really. I mean, I'm looking at the new Tinder. Okay, so these are people that I've matched with, and I hope I'm not, you know giving away too much privacy issues with these people. But, but, you know, okay, these aren't actually people that I've talked to, just people that I've matched with. I now have the option to, and they've looked at my profile, take a photo and then just go ahead and I'll, oh, God, I look really bad. Uh, okay, I'll just sort of like, uh, Sarah, ooh, look at me, I'm just looking up. Uh, okay, um, and then uh, send that photo to everybody who I've matched with so there's a little bit almost like of a Snapchat quality because these messages won't actually uh, live more than, I think it's about 24 hours after they're posted. So if somebody goes in like five days later, they're not going to see this photo of me. It's kind of like a right here and now type of a thing. And what the company does is they, they try to explain this as, listen, a lot of people can get matched together and it's not necessarily a love connection. We don't really want to just be like a dating app. We want to expand this a little bit more to somebody might seem interesting to you and you say you're interesting and they say you seem interesting and then you kind of have this you can sort of take it to the next level as far as like um sending photos and you know you can like write a little thing on top of the photo again it's very snapchat like mm -hmm. i'm excited about it because i feel like tinder is a little bit of a one note or has seemed like a little bit of a one note thing and that's why people say oh it's you know it's about like you know hooking up with people. What do you think about this? Or do you think that the reputation is already so ingrained that nobody's really gonna use this as a primary way to meet people? I cannot tell you in the past 48 hours how many of my friends have been talking to me nonstop about Tinder. So I feel like they're in such a, a great moment right now that they could almost do no wrong yeah. and people just love it, right? They love the app and so just seeing them evolve, I think, is a really smart idea because there are people who are absolutely hooked. I mean, uh, I've heard uh, um, people who literally, I have a friend who uh, I was just chatting to who was setting up Tinder dates like back to back every hour and just kind of getting through them quickly. And finally, she saw it's like speed dating, right? But you're actually in control. You don't have to go to an auditorium somewhere. So I know people love it, and uh, I think it's neat. I think they have a really user-friendly experience and hope they keep that up with whatever they develop. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's so funny to me that there are so many apps where it's like 
everyone's like, okay, so Snapchat is like a really big deal. WhatsApp is a really big deal. Facebook brought WhatsApp. Let's try to add as much of those features that we know mm -hmm. people want into our app and make it make sense. You know, this is a little bit of like a, okay, I guess, yeah. If I were to match with somebody, maybe I'm not ready to like meet them. Maybe, you know, there's like a few photos that can go back and forth type of a thing, mm -hmm. you know, to like learn a little bit more about their life. I don't know. I don't know if that's a stretch. I'll definitely try it out though. Cause yeah, I'm, I'm, Tinder's, it's, 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 it's a big deal. It's a big deal with people. It is a big deal. Yeah. And yeah. like you said, so, yeah, it's not just your friends. It's my friends too. It's all over the place, right? Yeah. Very it, popular. In fact, now it's getting to the point where people will send me screenshots of somebody that they have not decided which way to swipe on to ask my opinion. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, do what you feel. This isn't about me, it's about you. you know? Just be safe. Just be I, can't, safe. I can't swipe for you. Swipe your own stuff. Uh, reminder, we love hearing from all of you. Uh, it's fun to uh, send uh, us your recommendations for guests that you'd like us to interview. We've had a great run of guests lately. Um, you can, of course, write us at the social hour at twit.tv. You can uh, tweet at Amber and I throughout the week, Amber Mack or Sarah Lane on Twitter. Uh, you can leave us a voicemail at 2626-SOCIAL. It's our Google Voice mailbox. You can record a video. Uh, the list goes on. But, um, but definitely, if you've got any questions, comments, feedback, or ideas for us, let us know, and we will try to fit it into a future show. All right, Amber, before we get going, what is our Ratter Fad this week? Okay, so uh, this is a, a fun one, and this is from uh, a telecom company in Japan who has a robot called Pepper, and uh, the company is called SoftBank, and uh, I guess they've been into the robotics industry now for a while, but now they have a robot that's actually pretty affordable. It costs about $2,000, will be available next year, and not only will this robot understand what you're saying for the most part in terms of understanding about 4,500 Japanese words, but the robot will also understand if there's a certain tone to its master's voice and it will react to that as well. So it's a robot that uh, also works with a bunch of different apps, kind of like a, a home, I don't want to say servant, maybe more of an assistant or a friend for people. And as we hear more about robots in the home, and especially as they sense our our feelings. I'm just curious, Sarah, what do you think? I mean, is this rad or is it kind of a fad or is it just downright scary? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, I don't think the whole robot thing is a fad. I think that slowly but surely we are getting more comfortable with ways that robots actually help our lives, you know, become easier. We've talked about, was it on, was it here on the social hour where we talked about robots that uh, deliver food to you? I don't think so, but uh, that's must have been crazy. another show. I get my shows confused. I do too many shows now. <laughs> yeah, there was there's there's a, a restaurant. I think it's in Japan, probably, and or maybe it was China. And uh, there are like robot servers. You order food, and then a robot comes and 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 makes your food and brings you your food. And it's sort of you know it's a novelty, but mm. that's the sort of thing that I really do think in 20 years there will be situations, particularly in fast food environments, where that just makes more sense, and nobody would think that's weird, and we'll all laugh about how we used to be afraid of robots. But I think that the whole kind of companionship type thing is, you know, it's not insignificant. I think that there is a need that people have for that sort of thing. Did you see the movie Her? That was a, you know, that was more no. of a software program, but it's kind of the 6%. same idea where it's you, you have companionship from something that is not a human, but, but you can sort of have the same feelings towards that companion that you would. And I don't, I don't know. I, I I guess there is a little bit of a creep factor, but I'm not sure that it's a, you know it's a bad thing. I think it in many cases, if it brings you know joy to someone's life. I mean, this guy is cute. That's another thing that's very manipulative. It's like Wall-E, the movie, right? It's cute till he tries to kill you, Sarah, while you're sleeping. But he's not gonna do that. He's probably just gonna <laughs> sing me a lullaby or something. I I'm a sucker for things that are cute. So it's like if it's a kitten or a you know cute cartoon character or cute little robot it's like yes i want one and i want it i want it, it to cute. be my little friend he is cute i yeah. do think it's kind of rad i mean uh, you know i i'm a little bit concerned about robots taking over the world but uh, I, I think we're probably safe and uh, i think more than it being a fad i agree with you it's something that we're going to see more and more of and as a companion to people i mean i think about my grandmother who i just visited with she's 92 years old she's in a nursing home you know she gets very lonely and and uh, i think something like this would definitely cheer her up so um i think it fits into the rad category for sure well i do too 
I think it's Pepper the Robot, you are rad, and I don't think you're a fad. I, even if Pepper specifically is a fad, I think that the general trend is is just not going away. That's right. I think yeah. robots are, they're, they're coming for us. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> you should, You're so paranoid about robots. I didn't know this about you. You learn a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, you do a show with somebody long enough, and eventually the truth comes out. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, we've come to the end of our very social hour that we just had. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, those who uh, might not be joining us live but would like to watch a live show, we do this show on Thursdays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time. That covers uh, both Amber and my time zones, but you might be in another one. Join us if you can. It's always fun to have you. And for everybody who's chatting live, it's fun to sort of take your questions and comments and incorporate that into the show. But of course, you can go to twit.tv slash TSH. That is our website where all of our, when we say uh, show notes, all of our episodes not only have a video uh, from the show, but yeah, all of the articles that we talked about and links to our guests. And yeah, that was la that was last week with Stampy, who was a really, really fun guest. So much and, fun. and boy, did Amber, did did I get a lot of feedback from children, more than, than I've I ever know. had before, because he is such a huge star with kids, as you know. It's amazing. I, I couldn't stop smiling the whole video. So it was a fun interview. So definitely go back and check that out because he was a great guest. And let us know if you have ideas for other guests. Uh, we'll keep booking some people. Specifically, it's been fun to have people who really specialize in a certain platform because we can't really figure out how to do all of these as well as other people out there. So um, we'll keep booking guests, but definitely send us your suggestions. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We will see you next week on The Social Hour. Until then, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Ever MacArthur, and we'll see you soon.